Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, our participants hear us via the Zoom and also here in the uh, in the room. So we will continue in the afternoon sessions with uh, our local experts and uh, discussion on regenerative sustainability uh, topics uh, in the context of Serbia. So we will start with Mr. Martin Elezovic, member of the board of director of Serbia Green Building Council and CEO, CEO of RING, member of Serbia Green Building Council. Please, Mr. Martin, continue. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Martin Elezovic. I need to start the presentation just to see where it is. Okay, I think we are ready. Uh, so, hello again. My name is Martin Elezovic. I'm here representing Serbia Green Building Council. I will say a few words first about the Serbian Rebuilding Council and then after I will present you and share with you uh, some interesting facts about certified buildings portfolio in, in uh, Serbia. Uh, Serbian Green Building Council have been established uh, 10 years ago and last year we had celebration of about 10 years of uh, presence in uh, Serbian market where we are promoting uh, green and sustainable building practices. We as a, as a non-profit uh, and non-NGO uh, organization, we are uh, part of the World Green Building Council, where we are participating in the, in the initiatives uh, established on the, on the worldwide level uh, related to sustainable buildings and sustainable practices. Uh, our main activities in these times are related to, to media uh, coverage, uh, promotion and so social media presence and simply trying to educate people and uh, te technical uh, users of the buildings how to, how to implement all those uh, practices and how to, how to have a better sustainable buildings. Uh, we have uh, uh, our user database and, and members which are constantly expanding. Last year we got 30, uh, 13 new members and plus seven, seven individuals uh, as, uh, as an add-on to, to our existing uh, members. Mm. Basically, let's say I, I don't have too much to say about that. I think uh, we are uh, having a very interesting website and we are present on social media. So I'm asking everybody to come and to visit and to, to check what we are doing. And also I would like to invite you all to, to uh, join us and to join efforts to, in order to have a better sustainable business uh, the second The second part of this presentation is about the sustainable building projects in Serbia and one overview. So basically those data which I will show you are, uh, let's say, based on the, uh, on the latest information which are present on the, on the, on the LEED and BRIAM site which are listing uh, certified projects in Serbia. Uh, currently we have about 29 certified buildings with a total area of 425,000 square meters. About 55% of this area, area is LEED and 45 is BRIAM certified projects. Uh, currently, according, based on my knowledge, we have only these two certification systems. Maybe there is something else, but I'm really not aware and we as a, as a Serbian Rebuilding Council don't have this uh, information. So again, just to specify, we are talking here about certified buildings, so which already have certification. There are a lot of them which started, but uh, the certification process either never finished or they give up and so on. Uh, I will just, I wanted to show you how, how the green building movement started in Serbia and where we are now and uh, how it develops during the uh, time. So basically, the first the first building was registered in 2010. Unfortunately, this project was never certified. I was not involved in the project. I don't know all the information. Probably 
some some obstacles happened and nothing nothing happened with with this project. The next the next uh, important I believe time in in, in the timeline of sustainable buildings in Serbia is uh, year 2011 and 2012 when we got the first regulations about energy efficiency update and the first regulation about energy passport and i think this is very important for for us as a country simply to have a, a standardized approach how to assess uh, existing buildings and the new buildings which are designed and to be covered with the energy passport uh, the next uh, Milestone is uh, 2013 when we got the first certified building in Serbia, and I will I will just go through this milestone and after I will share with you how the building looks like and I will share maybe some most interesting topic about that building which I know. So the first certified building in Serbia is uh, Blue Center. Uh, this is one of the biggest biggest uh, office buildings in uh, Serbia, Serbia uh, where different companies can rent the space there. Uh, it's about 50,000 square meters. It is certified against BREMI News and they achieved very good and excellent certification level. Uh, uh, what is interesting about this project uh, is maybe the fact that they put a specific effort to organize the building systems and the construction so that interior works can be easily modified and to be easily adjusted to every new tenant which is coming. So basically with this in mind they are significantly reducing the output of the, of the waste uh, uh, which is happening after uh, fit out works for some new tenants which is coming. Please bear in mind that usually the lease agreements are on three years may be extended after that, but it could happen that after three years a new tenant is coming, new partition walls are need to be introduced and then you have a lot of waste. So by carefully designing a building and thinking about that, you can, you can prevent uh, a huge amount of waste which will happen during the life cycle of the, of the project. The next important thing was happening in 2014 when we had the first lead project and this was Uchi Shopping Center, uh, certified in, as a lead certified in 2014. Uh, at that time, this was the biggest and until recently the biggest shopping center in Serbia. Uh, uh, again, a lot of uh, activities presented with lead. Again, not personally involved in the project, but what I know is, uh, and you can see this when you visit the shopping center, they put uh, effort, significant effort to reduce the water consumption. And if you go and in public areas and when you see which uh, uh, water consuming devices they are using, you will see that specific uh, attention was made to, to have a significant reduction of water consumption. By this, when you're having less water consumption, you're also having less uh, disposal of water. And as in this regard, you are preventing additional pollution of water courses and so on. So basically this is also a very, very interesting uh, technique and, and feature to be implemented. In 2015, the next milestone is the first lead uh, operation and maintenance. Uh, this, uh, this is actually, okay, my, no, my, my mistake, so, yeah. Uh, not mistake, uh, GTC building. This is the first operational maintenance office space. Uh, shopping center was also operational maintenance, uh, but it was important to, to have also a office building, which is lead certified because in total building stock, office buildings will, will have more buildings present and it's uh, really important to have uh, suitable techniques where you will attack this uh, particular buildings and to, to try to, pro to provide sustainable solutions. Uh, this building is also interesting from one another perspective uh, and combined with the, the, with the next building which we, I will show you is the first building, one of two first buildings in Serbia which are built to be leased to external tenants and it was happening beginning 2000. Uh, 
before that, usually the buildings were owned by the by the occupant. Now people are building a building in order to lease it to the third parties. And today we had many, many different buildings, and uh, which are following this this uh, principle. So I think those those buildings are interesting from the perspective that the other buildings can follow their their uh, way how how they reach uh, sustainability goals. Here I call this building our building because this is the place where Serbia Green Building Council is uh, having office and. Uh, I am personally very connected to this building. I spent a lot of years in this building. And uh, this is the, together with the GTC building, uh, building Atrium, which is uh, again built in 2004, fifth, and was one of the first buildings uh, in, intended for, for, uh, for uh, leasing purposes. For example, here, what, what this building can teach us is the way how with the careful design you can we can solve many many different different uh, problems which are happening in in the building design so for example here you will see that there is a huge atrium and this feature was used to introduce the daylight into otherwise dark places and simply to reduce the energy consumption for lighting for let's say for a significant amount Beside, beside that, atrium is used to use uh, uh, waste heat, which are discharged to the atrium, and after that, reused later with, with mechanical systems. There are uh, free cooling techniques, which have been built inside, and uh, logical and flexible organization of space. And from my experience, I can really say that uh, even th this building is one of the first buildings which are built in for leasing, majority of others which are following this trend, they rarely bring something new. So and this is something what, what I would like to emphasize, that we really need to try to learn from the other projects and then to try to, to, try to uh, implement all the techniques which are present and to use it for, for the new buildings which we are designing. One interesting thing, our picture was reached uh, lead site, so basically when you go to lead, you will always see the lead uh, atrium building certified as an illustration of operational maintenance building. So this is one interesting thing. The next, I think, important, important milestone is uh, 2019, when we reached the first lead platinum building. And if you're not familiar with lead, uh, lead is rating by, let's say, certified, silver, gold, and platinum, and platinum is the highest rating. So basically, when you reach platinum, you, let's say, can say that this building is really, really very efficient. And not only efficient, but many sustainable features are installed and implemented in, in, this, in this building. Uh, this building is uh, Lidl logistics center and I'm not sure I must here stress out that I was not part of this project and I don't know exactly this is an illustration which I have maybe is wrong sorry for that if wrong but anyhow one of the little has several buildings certified one of the building has a platinum and just as an illustration because this is only information which I have is to show you how advanced is this building compared to all other buildings certified so basically here you can see uh, several clusters and from left to right you have first the certified level after 50 is silver then after, uh, uh, above 60 are gold and only this small part above 80 are platinum buildings so basically in a cumulative way if you see how many buildings are there certified and then how advanced lead platinum must be in order to reach platinum then you should appreciate better maybe what 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 is rich in this on this project. The next interesting things, and this is the trend from the last year, is that uh, international companies may, mainly, and the big investors, they are uh, uh, going on into the portfolio approach certification. So basically they are certifying the whole portfolio of their properties. 
And what happened in 2020 is the CTP certified four of their properties in Serbia, but not only in Serbia, I think they certified their whole portfolio in Europe. So we are speaking about I know, 100 or something plus buildings. I, I don't have the exact date. Again, those are the illustrations of projects in Serbia only. Uh, they used BRIAMI News for this particular uh, project. And this is something that could be very interesting for for portfolio owners because once when you certify the whole portfolio, then you can really make a sustainability strategy uh, for the for the whole portfolio because then you will see which building is behaving better or worse in the whole portfolio, then you can act on, on this particular building. Uh, there are a few others which are ongoing. I cannot mention them here, but let's say I, I believe in next years we will have a lot of similar buildings like this. Uh, in 2001, I'm expecting that we will have that we will have first BRIEM International New Construction Building. And this is a building where I was heavily involved and I believe that it's worth mentioning that this is one, in my opinion, one of the most advanced building in Serbia. And I wanted to share with you what is what is present, what, what was implemented there. The building is uh, Ušće Tower 2. Uh, construction started in 2016, design actually, then after that construction. Uh, this building is really implementing some of the techniques which are not uh, present regularly on any other building in, in Belgrade, according to my knowledge. Uh, they have a controlled natural ventilation system and they, they are promoting this as a b building with, which breathes and uh, I think this is, uh, this is some, some very interesting feature because it allows uh, end users simply to control whether they want to open uh, and to control the fresh air intake into the building. Again, the windows and, and everything is designed to maximize daylight and to the, 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 the whole layout of the building is organized to have a maximum efficiency of the, of the usage of the office space and to have maximum efficiency of the daylight and to implement all, all uh, benefits for the health and well-being of the occupants. If you go on, on this side, and I advise you to go, uh, the, the entrance lobby is something which is really iconic, I would say. Uh, uh, I don't, I didn't have the, this experience in any other building, so basically it, it's, it's really nicely done and it shows a little bit in which direction it could, it could be. As well as, uh, as the landscaping around the building. This is something what I would uh, recommend for everybody who are dealing with the landscaping, with the ecology features, and about about uh, uh, some even green roofs, for example, to go and to go there and to see how how the how the planting was carefully selected in order to in order to provide the, the shelter for for many insects, birds, and uh, and uh, many other things which organisms which are living there. So this, you simply need to go there and to, and to see. It's, it's really something which is, what is extraordinary in, in, in our, and again, there is a view. Once when you go there, you will see what I mean. So basically this is a view from, I think, 22nd floor on the, on the museum and on the, on the Kalemegdan old fortress in Belgrade at the confluence of river of South Belgrade and South. So, yeah. This is some project which is excellent interim certified and this year I think it will be final one. Uh, but here I would like also to, to address one, one concern. And this is, those are all extraordinary examples of buildings which are present in Serbia and the others should follow up this. But the problem is that this diagram, if you are looking at it only like this, you see there is a trend linear exponential, how to call it, but there is a rising trend that we are having more and more certified buildings. Problem is, when you compare it with the uh, old buildings which are built, uh, we are speaking about 0.02% of number of old buildings, or about 2% of square meters built per year. 
are certified. So meaning that only 2% on average, I would say 1.5, 2% of square meters which are built in Serbia, they are getting certified. And only 2.02% uh, of number of buildings are getting certified. So this is a really small number and we, we need to think how to increase this in order to promote, promote it more because those bu buildings are really doing something additional which, which uh, is above the standard, standard practice. So basically, this first 29 buildings are looking maybe okay when you compare it with the region and so on. But when you compare it to the whole building stock in Serbia, this is 0.001% of all buildings in Serbia are certified. Again, total area 425,000. Uh, it's relative, we can speak about that. But at the end, it's 0.11% of, of the whole building stock in Serbia. And again, uh, energy efficiency regulations in energy passport in Serbia introduced in 2012. So far, only 3.4% of buildings entered this into the database of the passports, energy passports, which is just a small effort of the engineers to bring some data which can be later used for other to improve the whole thing. So I think we, uh, uh, we need to uh, jump. I would use the phrase which Jana used and to have a triple jump and then triple jump and triple jump in order to increase those those figures because otherwise we will never reach uh, never reach the requested uh, levels of of uh, energy savings and the other important things in order to reach sustainability and then later restorative re regenerative buildings. Here as a, just as an illustration I wanted to show you where we are current standing from the perspective of energy co consumption. And I'm, I'm uh, always using energy because I believe that the energy is the major contributor to CO2 emissions, major contributor to green, greenhouse gases emissions and in building buildings and it, it, it is important to address this because based of all our analysis which we have done, a life cycle assessment analysis of different high performance buildings, about 70 to 75 percent of the greenhouse gases effect are contributions are coming out from the energy efficiency, energy consumption. So here uh, the older buildings which I show you in uh, in, in and similar buildings from this era, from 2000 or something. So we are speaking about new buildings which are built 20 years ago. They are consuming about 300 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. The newer buildings maybe which are built in the last few years, the best one are using about 200 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. But in order to reach some acceptable level, which is considered as low energy use, we need to reach 70. So this means that we need to reduce by 65% the best practice which we have now. And this is something what needs to be addressed and we need to provide efficient solutions, we need to provide practical techniques to engineers, to design teams, so that they are aware what needs to be done so that they can reach this 70%. Otherwise, by do, doing the standard practice, it will happen that we are continuously having the rising of the primary energy consumption in, in the building sector year by year, and not reduction, what is our goal. So this is one elephant in the room I wanted to address. So basically, this is the diagram, but I am focusing on this area here, and I really believe that in the next years, we will have much more certificate buildings, and I really believe that we will find a way to reach these low carbon buildings at the end of 2050 as the goal for the union is. So, this is from my part. Uh, I don't know if there are some questions, or maybe we can continue later if, if we are behind schedule.
Well, uh, we are slightly behind schedule, but uh, does anybody from the audience have a question? Yes, Mariella? Uh, which are the reasons why the duty to travel is not regulated, uh, is not certificated apart from uh, maybe it's not a part of the regulation or there is some special reason why it is yeah. not There is. Yeah, a building certification is not uh, a regulatory obligation. So basically it's not regulated by laws and bylaws and so on. So this is voluntarily uh, action. And usually, and if you, if, you, if you check the timeline, you will see that the first buildings which are certified are actually certified. The owners behind those buildings are international investors. And basically international investors are bringing the best practice on Serbian market. What is happening lately, and I cannot recall precisely, but I believe actually all buildings which I show you, uh, those are international inv investors, I believe. And majority of, of buildings are international investors. Uh, one funny thing, for example, 50% of all certified buildings in Serbia are in two streets in New Belgrade. 50%. So those are these uh, important two streets where all new buildings are built and those are those are those uh, modern office office buildings which are present uh, why the rest of buildings are not following that probably is uh, lack of, of knowledge lack of expertise uh, probably time pressure because they need to do some additional things which they should not do in in the regular standard pro building design and costs, of course. You will have some, some costs. But those costs can be offset if you are designing carefully and smart enough. You can, you can use the synergies simply to, to, to design even, to reduce even investment and to reduce even operational cost. And I had such kind of examples in my, ex in my practice where we advised investor and we reduced both investment costs and operational. This is win-win strategy for everybody. But somebody needs to ask and somebody needs to start to think about it. And I think this is the most important thing and I'm glad to be here and I hope that at least we triggered some questions and somebody will, let's say, ask for advice and then after that, who knows what will happen. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, so... For any questions, you, you can reach Serbian Rebuilding Council. You have here contacts, so basically feel free to contact us for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, we now continue with uh, uh, Mr. Jovan Mitrovic, also a member of Serbian uh, Green Building uh, Council and a uh, member of uh, Serbia Green Building Council and CEO of LPG Studio. Jovan, are you with us? Yeah, I hope that you hear me. Yes, yes, we hear you, we hear you properly. And have you seen me? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay, uh, I, I will speak a little bit about some formal things in the beginning of my work and everything else and I, after that jump on presentation. I was preparing this uh, presentation for a few weeks, uh, partially and in the last moment, I tear up everything and decided to jump on another way to explain uh, what I'm doing and what is my goals and what is my motto of my architectural work. Um, Usually people start with who are they and what are they working. I'm just an architect. Uh, I worked on three, uh, my architecture and life principles, which are three S as uh, solid pillars of my work, which is uh, simplicity, sustainability, and social responsibility. I think that uh, this defined the general plane of my work as the three points def define any plane. Uh, today, uh, I will start that I do not consider myself as a scientist or man of science, but truly I believe that science provided this uh, 
what we call the today civilization. And uh, I can say that I'm um, some kind of practical architectural explorer instead of scientist. Uh, the most of people or architects uh, find their influences and role models in the famous and well-known architects. For this topic we are speaking about, I found the contrary, uh, my influencer and my role model in my son, who is, uh, runs uh, with uh, his professor on the Royal College of Art in London, the sustained model at, uh, design engineering department. He infected me with this uh, thinking about the earth and about everything else. When, when we were kids, and my brother and me were the only uh, children in the neighborhood who stayed uh, home during the summer holidays. Everybody has someone on the countryside and go there and enjoy nature. So I think that this is another uh, thing which I, which in, which I get it in these uh, latest years of my life to be as much closer to nature because of lack in childhood. So I don't want, this is what I'm speaking about generally about me and my work. And I think that uh, it will be much interesting that you will sh see what's going on on the, my presentation. I think that I will try now to share my screen uh, just to find where it is. Hmm. Should be. No, this is it. So. Hmm. Mm -hmm. oh. I think that now you see all, I will start with the first of one. This is the competition where we won the first prize. Uh, people from Belgrade recognize this building. This is the old bank, former Energo Prague building on the very center of Belgrade, on the hard top of the Belgrade uh, place where is the pollution is on the highest level. And the investor who bought it, it's a German firm, Stadtwerk, decided to make the first eco center in Belgrade bus just on the Zeleni Venets, which means uh, green... Uh... Hello, Jovan, Jovan, sorry. We do not see your uh, presentation nor your screen. Did you share it properly? Uh, as I, you heard me, but th th this is what we had in the beginning, and after that, what we presented to the competition jury. I uh, work with my architectural studio, which is called LFG, which is the shorts of uh, Living Future Green. Four years ago, I founded this uh, office just to promote the sustainable and green building uh, in Serbia, and I try to do it through my practice and to keep it uh, through my career in the future. The idea was uh, just to, this, uh, this skeleton of the old building was rest, and there is two on the left and the right buildings which should be demolished and the component in one complex. Uh, we decided to use uh, many of things just to show, because the idea is to get inside the all firms and the institutions and the NGOs who are dealing with the, uh, ecology and to promote uh, the green building and everything which is sustainability and after and this it was a very great idea. Unfortunately it will not be because the city authorities, especially the Heritage Protection Institute, doesn't allow it to change the facade which was from 60s. Well, and the idea was to make an internal life with the nature and to get some kind of uh, buffers between this uh, facade, open facade, with this uh, formal facade in front to, uh, to keep the memory of the place with these old buildings which existed there. And uh, we promote first time uh, the mechanical garage which uh, also uh, reduce the pollution from the 
cars because they're the only electrical elevators bring the cars inside. Also, we made on the top of this smaller part here, the, some kind of uh, producing uh, vegetables and fruits for the restaurant, which is totally close chain on the top for this building. This is on the section you see, if you see my mouse going on, this is on the top of this and the restaurant on the top. And this is uh, generally the pro project which uh, we used to, we made also this photovoltaic uh, shades which collect the energy, the pillars and the piles in the foundation are also the, uh, for the keeping the energy from, taking energy from the soil and we use also the whole system of uh, water saving and everything else inside, also to produce energy by wa walking on. Also, we as this lost some trees on this on this street, which is very narrow. We made on the left corner some kind of big uh, pots on the first floor to get the trees to get shade down. It's some kind of experiment. How can you provide many different, with many different things, some interesting architecture with the really natural materials, not natural, but with low emission and good quality materials, which provide less energy consumption and also the, the less energy emission. And uh, I'm very sorry because this project will not be uh, fulfilled, but anyhow, it is uh, interesting to work on. I will jump after that on one of the, my latest projects. This is the second one. It's the small family house. It's called the Recycling and Accessibility. I give it name because it's also the one project, very small family house for just uh, one family of friends of mine who has a special need to keep uh, as much as possible from the old house, which was there on the site but not to make it as a reconstruction of that house, but also to uh, reusing of material on the site. That was my proposition to them and they accepted. Of course, the windows and window frames are uh, made by the new materials and also to provide the good quality of uh, consumption to reduce the consumption of energy and to provide possibility to keep uh, everything as much as possible inside of flight and uh, comfort in interior. The brick we used, it was the old brick which was cut on the half, you will see. And also on the facade, we used some parts which we take from the old building. Of course, it was not enough. We added new ones and you can see the difference, which I don't mind at all, the difference of the color and everything on the inside. Uh, the general, I will drop first on the drawings and I will return back on the, this is, well, this, this was my idea, I will explain you. Through the process, I think that it would be much more interesting, it would be more interested to provide as much as possible free, free and green part of the land. And I used this kind of, kind of Chinese symbol of Buddhism symbol of yin and yang, where is the, Yang is the artificial and yin is the green. And I think that this balance of nature and arti artifacts are the most important thing, how we as an architect, architect deal with in the city or, or not only in the city. This is the form of the old buildings which was existed here. And we use it just to keep as a memory of the place, adding this wooden beam on the top. Uh, this is what we did. We used the old beams. We cut it in a, um, in a pieces and use it to, for the facade. Also, we cut the brick on different ways to make to provide the stock. Here, we made the possibility of very uh, thick, uh, 20 centimeters thick thermal mineral fiber uh, wool insulation and 90% of thermal block, the brick thermal block. 
And this is the cut with air beneath. And this is what we use, the natural materials as much as it possible. And as we turn back on the house, you will see that we keep this huge uh, tree in front and keep all the organization in front of it. The front yard is just dominant. The part of the building is this one. Behind is the, this uh, small yard on the down level and these terraces with a ramp, it's provided that you, you can use from this side to the, that side, everything else. We also make this new, we planted these new trees, which will provide the shade after that in, in, uh, through the summer and keep this uh, part uh, without uh, uh, direct sun. It's natural shade instead of to do some, of course, this will not reach that height and that's why we made this uh, special job of things. Also, we always have some small windows where we keep uh, for ventilation and for uh, to get mosquito nets and everything else which you need to keep in this house. Under the terrace are all the utilities which you need for the house. The, 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 on the top of this uh, brick part is the green garden, which are used from the top. And that's uh, generally the main things about this building. If someone wants to see other projects, you really can jump on my uh, site. It's yon.mitrovic.uk and see all of my projects. If also there you will find there are also the plans and layouts where you can see how it's function. And um, as I have still five minutes, as I know, I decided to add one extra bonus, although it was not in the primary presentation defined. It's uh, my project, which I consider as my uh, architectural motto, where I make the small uh, sports hall in the first elementary school in Obreno, it's city near the Belgrade. And why I'm showing is because it's one uh, very important for me uh, topic. It's uh, sustainability in a urban design, not only the housing. Because in this project, you will see from the this schedule, this small uh, sketch, the, this is the volume of the house, if it would be on the ground, and uh, it will occupy the whole the schoolyard between this is all with, with two, and the children will lose the place where to play. And then I decided to sink it down in the earth on the level of the underground water and to private on the top of the whole premises around to keep the grass and to get the open air for the children. And uh, according to the Serbian norms and laws, there is no possible to make fully underground uh, premises where the children are taking classes, although it's just one class. And that's, this is the top of the uh, object is out or on the top. The first idea was to sink it more Three, me three meters and to get amphitheater here to get uh, possibility to on the top of the floor get the green garden fully and to get also the tri uh, for the spectacles for this open area. The material we use is the uh, concrete for waterproof concrete in the basement which is natural material and also keep all the energy from the soil through this concrete. And this provides with the heating pumps, the, the renewed energy. And uh, the top is full in the wood, uh, laminated or CLT. And uh, this is the, the some kind of protection, not only the sun protection, also for the bolt protection. Just enough that the handball won't go through the basketball and football for sure. And that's why we decided to make also in wood. And I think this project is very 
interesting and could show how much important is that architects from the very beginning think about how it will use the um, plot or the land. And because this is the only re non reusable, reusable thing. Uh, if you destroy the land, then you will not be able to make it again for 50 or 70 years and such more. This is, I think, quite enough for me. And it's now it's 19 minutes. I hope that it's enough. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jovan. You can st uh, stop uh, screen sharing. Okay. In just a second. Yeah. Yes. Are there any questions from the audience for Jovan? No, we can continue then uh, to the roundtable discussion for any further questions. And I would announce now Filip Stanić. Uh, Dr. Filip Stanić, he's specialist in urban uh, hydrology and green roofs from the Faculty of Civil Engineering, uh, Belgrade. Okay. So, uh, my name is Filip Stanić. And uh, yeah, uh, today I will talk about mostly about Eupolis project and uh, yeah, about the Eupolis, generally Eupolis approach and I will put more focus on, uh, on green roofs. So this is just a brief uh, content of the presentation. So I will, as I said, I will talk about uh, generally about the Eupolis, then about the Eupolis interventions in Belgrade, then I will jump to green roofs and explain different uh, different functions of, of green roofs and uh, give some perspectives on green roofs in, in Eupolis. So Eupolis is a part of a Horizon 2020 European project uh, and it aims improving public health and, and well-being through uh, building uh, different nature-based solutions. So uh, there, is, there are many, uh, many participants in, in, this, in this project and uh, Belgrade is one of the largest or maybe the largest uh, urban demo site uh, within this project and numerous uh, interventions are planned to be built and, uh, and investigated in Belgrade. So green roofs are only one part of these uh, interventions but they are basically the most widely used type of of MBSs and they have multiple multiple functions and also during my PhD I was dealing uh, with uh, with green roofs so that's why I will I will focus on them uh, today uh, and at the end yeah I will give their perspectives so uh, there the within Eupolis project there are some innovative tools that are planned to be used so first, there is a extensive uh, participatory planning, which means that basically different uh, stakeholders are, uh, we are planning to involve different stakeholders in, in decision making. Also, there will be monitoring of uh, different urban, environmental, uh, socioeconomic and public health and well-being parameters. And uh, yeah, I will again put the emphasis on these public health and well-being uh, indicators because it's the, the the main idea of the whole of the whole project. And uh, in terms of that, there will there will be some um, as presented here this uh, wristband and heart around uh, kind of devices uh, that uh, volunteers will carry on for some time, and then we will monitor their their health and uh, yeah their health parameters let's say such as pulse uh, heart rate and uh, pre blood pressure and, and things like that and we will try to find ki uh, a correlation between those uh, health indicators and development of, of uh, nature-based uh, systems and at the end also it's planned to to make some innovations in terms of modeling and numerical analysis uh, in terms of interactions between urban components and ecosystem services. 
So here I presented the different partners that are in, uh, involved in this project. So on the left side are basically academic and, and, and research uh, partners. Then in the, in the middle we have this uh, private, we have here private companies and on the right side are uh, different cities that are, that are involved. And as I said, Belgrade is the, is the largest uh, demo site in the, in the whole project. And in Belgrade, there, there will be two uh, micro locations, or maybe not so micro, but so two locations that will be uh, where we are planning to uh, build different nature-based systems. So first one is Linear Park, which is presented here on the, on the right, top right side. Uh, so currently it's an industrial zone, and it used to be a railway uh, railway track about four kilometers long, uh, and now it, it's basically it's uh, in the whole surrounding. It's a very uh, vibrant community, and it's in contact with with two rivers. But as I said, uh, right now there is there is basically nothing there, so we are trying to to make it w with this uh, w within this project. We are trying to make it alive. Let's say. And uh, the second location is this Ursche Park. Uh, now about this Ursche Park, yeah, I, I will not talk about the specific location because it's still, it's still unknown, it's not defined, but uh, uh, it's, it's in general that is already an existing park and in, it's located in a highly urbanized part of Belgrade. And, uh, in the near vicinity of the River Danube and Museum of Contemporary Arts. So yeah, I, I saw uh, I saw some of the speakers after me will will talk about uh, linear park. So I will just briefly say about this uh, Ushe Park. So here is a scheme of the different uh, interventions that are planned to be to be built. So one of those interventions is, is this uh, pocket park, uh, which will be equipped with uh, multifunctional canopy units that, are, that will create uh, natural shedding. And it will be used for, uh, it's planned at least to be used for, uh, for example, to, to make, uh, to build some bus stops there for playing chess, for socializing and, uh, and stuff like that. And then also it is planned to build uh, this uh, uh, surface waterway. And also there, there will be this integrated wetland with different biofilters that, that are used for stream water treatment. And finally, the, the, yeah, the, the biggest part of this uh, in, in this Ushche Park should be uh, this Eco Edu multifunctional center, and uh, the biggest part of it is planned to be used for uh, wastewater treatment using uh, innovative, innovative technologies. And uh, here are presented two, for example, the two of these, uh, uh, two of these objects or similar objects. Yeah. So one in Japan and one in Turkey. The big, the bigger one in Japan and the smaller one in Turkey and uh, this yeah th this object is multifunctional because besides the wastewater treatment it will be also used for as a conference center for education also there will be some uh, yeah for example coffee shop and at the, bo at the top of the building of the top of the object is planned to have also a green roof uh, that I will I will talk later about it have also multiple functions but one of them is also urban farming, uh, that can be, yeah, which can be rather interesting. So now I will jump to, to green roofs. Uh, first, I will say some general characteristics of green roofs. So they are basically they are the most widely used type of uh, nature-based solutions, and they have multiple functions. And main functions are reduction of the urban water runoff and reduction of the urban heat island effect. Uh, but besides that, there is also uh, air cleaning, urban gardening and farming, then also 
uh, yeah, the improving indoor thermal comfort and so on. So here is the uh, scheme of the, of, the, of the green roof. So few basic layers. So first one is uh, uh, contains plants and then we have a substrate. We have geotextile after the drainage layer and so on. Uh, so, in, in the literature, basically two different types, main types of, of green roofs are intensive and extensive green roofs. And uh, the main difference is basically, uh, the main difference is related to the thickness of the, of, of the soil. Also, this intensive, because these intensive green roofs, they're, they're thicker, that, because of that they have better retention properties so they, they can store more water but they are more, de more demanding for maintenance and also they, are, they produce a significant load on the roof uh, and of course extensive green roofs are everything opposite mostly but uh, in, in general these, this type of these two types cannot be so clearly divided because it's very uh, it's very, it, it depends very much on the site. It's very site specific, because uh, from from experience I know that basically green roofs, uh, all of them, you can call it, call them in intensive or extensive. They they need to be maintained, otherwise uh, they are basically ruined and they don't have any purpose. So I will now yeah I will now talk about few main aspects of green roofs so first and this this one i was uh, with this one i was dealing on my during my phd so basically it's um, runoff water quantity or reduction of the runoff water quantity uh, so the main purpose is to reduce store water quantities entering the sewer system and the second one is also to reduce and delay the storm water rate peak because in terms of uh, in case of urban flooding uh, let's say stone water, store water rate, rate peak is more more critical than the volume, than the water water quantities. So to design green roofs, it is necessary to first to know the hydraulic properties of the substrate that that will store the water, and then when you know that, you can introduce these properties into the rainfall runoff model. Uh, and you can simulate the infiltration uh, through the substrate layer for a given rainfall, critical rainfall event. And yeah, so in in this case, I was I was working on this uh, on this green roof. So this is in Paris, in in front of the Col de Pont Paris Tech. Uh, so th this green roof is called Green Wave because it has a, as you can see, it has a wavy shape. And the model I, I developed there was tested on the measurements. So the measurements of the drain, the discharge that was collected uh, on, on, on this roof. So here I, I just presented uh, briefly. So we have, so as I said, you have soil hydraulic properties. So these are the experimental data and these are the the uh, data uh, uh, these are the, these are the red, the red line represents the data obtained with the soil model that was also developed during my thesis and then after introducing these data into the uh, this CNLR model which is rainfall runoff model you you obtain something like this so basically it shows that uh, with this, you can simulate the the discharge that is that is drained through the bottom of the roof, and you, yeah, you, you can simulate it quite accurately. Uh, and in particular, in particular in this roof, uh, it's a good example of the not so not so well maintained roof, because that, this roof, on this green wave roof, he, it, it was not. Uh, uh, it was not irrigated almost at all, so maybe during the first year, but then after that, for several years, it was not irrigated at all. So basically, you have all the fine particles of the soil washed out. You have all the vegetation died, 
and at the end so yeah the, the picture i showed here is basically at the at the beginning where where it was green and nice but now it's mostly yellow and uh, and these results also show that if you if you calculate the amount of water that is stored in the uh, or that is drained sorry that is drained through the bottom of the roof and the amount of water that is fallen on the on the top of the roof you can see very insignificant amount of water is really stored and remains retains inside of the roof but most of it goes goes just through it uh, nevertheless it still helps uh, how to say yeah it, it still helps it still helps to mitigate the the discharge but if it was well maintained it will be much much more effective Uh, so that, that was about the water quantity. In terms of water quality, so as, uh, green roofs are not so much designed for uh, to deal with water quality, and they have both positive and negative effects on water quality. So, for example, in terms of heavy metals, they they decrease the amount of heavy metals in in storm water compared to the conventional roofs. But on the other hand, in terms of nutrients or uh, fertilizers and pesticides. It's, it doesn't have very positive effect because if you if you use for example green roof for for uh, urban farming and then you use some pesticides or fertilizers then you will have all these uh, components in the roof, in the um, in the water that is drained through the through the bottom and finally yeah I will just speak a little bit about this urban heat island effect. So this is not I was something I was dealing with, but uh, one of my colleagues that is also uh, yeah, co-author here was uh, working on, on this. Uh, and uh, so that's why I'm presenting it. So green roofs are also, they reduce the temperature locally. And this local reduction of the temperature is, uh, it can be even, even it can be significant compared to the surrounding urban areas. So, also, it's besides that, it provides also a thermal comfort. Uh, let's say uh, internal interior uh, thermal comfort in indoor indoor thermal comfort. Yeah, uh, especially in the in the rooms that are located below the green roof. Uh, so, to simulate or to predict the. The, the ground temperature, so the temperature on the on the on the roof surface, you need to combine something. Uh, you need to combine the rainfall runoff model that I presented uh, before, or not exactly that rainfall runoff model, but some rain rainfall runoff model that will give you the amount of water stored in the in the roof, and then to combine it with the energy balance model. Uh, and why is that necessary? Because all these uh, soil thermal properties they depend on the on the amount of water in the in the substrate uh, so in uh, in in this specific study uh, energy balance model was developed in university of calabria and there was a collaboration between this university and the faculty of civil engineering in in belgrade where this rainfall runoff model was developed so by combining these two models uh, that there would so by combining these two models, they they made a, a model that predicts the, for example, the ground temperature on the green roof. And this mod this model was tested on the measurements obtained on the green roof in Italy. And yeah, here are presented these uh, these results. So finally, I would just. Uh, uh, briefly say about perspectives of, uh, of green roofs in Neopolis. So one of the places where green roofs are planned to be implemented is uh, this Equedo uh, center uh, or this object that will be somewhere in, in Ushche Park, we don't know where. Uh, so besides the thermal comfort and reduction of the snow water runoff, the green roof is to be used as a urban garden with, with the 
uh, metal station also, so it's an additional, additional function. And this, uh, this green roof uh, can be used uh, for popularization of green roofs because this, through this urban uh, gardening or farming, it, you, we can improve the biodiversity in cities and also create a feeling uh, of ownership and uh, community participation. So, also, finally, I would like to say that Belgrade has plenty of uh, potential for, for green roofs because many of the old buildings, they're uh, designed to carry on an additional load. And so the green roofs can be, uh, can be implemented on the existing roofs but also on the existing buildings but also through the some regulation regulations uh, it is possible to yeah to make every new building for example have a uh, have a green green roof as a so this to be obligatory let's say uh, so yeah that's that's all for me thank you Thank you, Felix. Please stop sharing the screen. Okay. No, no, no. No, 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 no. no. Okay. Okay, um, we go further. Uh, is there any questions for Philip? If not, we go further. At the round table, we will still speak with our speakers. Uh, we transfer the microphone to Mr. Darko Šutanovac from the City of Belgrade, Chief Urban Planner Office. He will be addressing regenerative topics from the Muslim implementation point of view. Well, thank you all. Uh, it was a very uh, educative presentation that you had. Also, um, I would thank you, Philip, also for uh, being a part of El Poli's project, where Belgrade is a partner. Uh, when I was uh, in my, in younger years, uh, I was a, I'm an architect by my vocation. I started planting uh, um, green roofs. I did it uh, last time. I did it. It was in the residence of the Brazilian ambassador here in Belgrade. He had some garage, and we planted some green roof on top. And now I think that uh, the people working there in the residence are cursing me because it's very hard to uh, maintain this, uh, this green roof on top. They don't know how to cut it or uh, to maintain. Maybe you can sign the letter and maybe <laughs> write down the instruction how to use it. Uh, I'm not some specialist at the regenerative cities, but I studied a little bit. And uh, I was a part of uh, one, uh, for me, uh, the biggest project here in Belgrade in, uh, when we are, playing, we are speaking about uh, regenerations and public spaces. It's the linear park, and I will try to find uh, the way to explain you how we addressed, uh, how we addressed to regenerate the city of Belgrade uh, in one particular case, which is a linear park in one particular project. So let me speak about first about the Belgrade. We have a lot of foreigner, uh, foreign guests here. Well, Belgrade is the capital of Republic of Serbia. It is located on uh, the confluence of two rivers, uh, international rivers, the Danube and, and the Sava. It's about 1.7 uh, million people are living here uh, in the wider area. 1.3 is living in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the urban parts of the city. Uh, it is the fourth largest city in southeastern Europe. We are just after Istanbul, Athens, and Bucharest. The city of Belgrade is a specific territorial unit, and uh, it has 17 municipalities. And uh, during 2020, Belgrade issued about 1.6 million square meters of construction permits, which places Belgrade as a uh, one of the largest construction building construction cities in the in the Europe. Uh, also, the Belgrade is home on, on of one of the uh, biggest largest construction sites in Europe. Uh, it's Belgrade waterfront. It's about 1.8 million square meters, and uh, now it is constructed 
by the end of 2020, it was co constructed uh, 150,000, and 750,000 are in construction currently. We also have, in this project, we have the, the Belgrade uh, Tower, and uh, with its height of 168 meters and 42 floors, is the tallest building in Balkans. Also, we are, by the end of next year, of, of this year, we are starting to, uh, starting the construction of the Belgrade Metro Station, the Line 1. And uh, we, well, all of these projects that I told about, they are very, some shiny facts about the Belgrade, but I think that uh, you will also think of this as, um, will lose its glitter because uh, if, it, if they are not collected and uh, not, they, don't par they don't make a part, that they are not determined by one word, which is sustainability. Many of you, many of people will ask, uh, will say, wow, it's a huge things that is going on in Belgrade. Some of them will not like it because, oh, I don't like it or I have some emotional memory about the places where I live and I want to stay the way they are. And uh, some of them will ask, okay, but is this sustainable? So uh, let's see what, hell, what Belgrade has with the plans uh, for the public spaces. Uh, Belgrade has adopted a strategy of, uh, for development, is, uh, which, is, uh, which has strategic goals, priorities, and measures for sustainable development until 2021. It has, it has a genera uh, general regulation plan. Uh, it, this plan just makes a uh, continuity of the general urban plan. It is taking into account the current construction rate uh, realistic assessments of the physical possibilities for further investment in the city. Uh, general regulation plan also has a continuity in transportation and infrastructural planning in accordance with the current and planned land use. It has integration of different development without negative influence for uh, each other. And it's uh, planning the protection and development of remaining natural green belt as well as nurturing the inner city greenery. Belgrade has urban plan of general regulation of green areas, which uh, context in, in which the context is sustainability development, which defines plans and principles of connecting green areas, achieving multifunctionality and accessibility, and preserving the character of landscape and biodiversity uh, improvements. What Belgrade has also uh, adopted very recently, it's the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan. It, uh, there is uh, one competition uh, now, uh, and Belgrade is, uh, is in the finals with this uh, uh, mobility plan. Well, uh, this SUMP, uh, it defines the obligation to implement the projects that increase the percentage of pedestrians and cyclists in model share for the next 10 years. And uh, we think that we should protect the environment, raise uh, uh, the general level of public health, and lo lower CO2 emissions. Also, Belgrade has action plan for adoption of climate change and world, uh, vulnerability uh, assessments. Uh, it was made in 2015. There are some plans that uh, Belgrade is going to have, and it's very important for everybody that lives here in Belgrade to be a part of it. Uh, it's the uh, general urban plan of uh, Belgrade for uh, 2041. Uh, it is uh, designed by, uh, now is the, the, uh, the starting of, the, of drafting this uh, plan. And uh, the Urban Planning Institute is uh, the designer. Well, uh, this project, this uh, plan will define the strategic concepts of development and protection of the city as European metropolis, the center of administration, culture, business, and commerce. In the website of uh, the Institute of uh, Urban Planning, uh, you have uh, one um, questionnaire where you can also add your uh, opinions about the strategic uh, questions uh, in this, which you can, 
Well, uh, also we mentioned in one part, we, the city of Belgrade in 2018 signed the global covenant of, major, of mayors for the climate and energy. Uh, it was on October of 2018 and uh, it, uh, it committed to reduce the carbon dioxide uh, in some sectors of, of, uh, of the planning in 40 percent and to increase the city resilience to the impact of the climate change and provide secure access to sustainable and affordable energy by 2030. Uh, as a result of this, uh, uh, of this covenant, uh, Belgrade is uh, drafting uh, two uh, action plans. One is sustainable energy uh, uh, and climate action plan which in broader sense should uh, address all the environment uh, challenges, water, land, air, uh, and uh, Belgrade is also drafting a Green City Action Plan, which uh, is representing uh, the vision of the Green City uh, for the 2030, and provides a financially sustainable plan uh, for achieving the ambition of Belgrade to win the Green City of Europe capital uh, uh, award in near future. Uh, all, both of these plans were already uh, presented in the public consultation process last month. And uh, in the Green City Action Plan, uh, among all uh, the activities, uh, there is one which, uh, which I will talk about. It's a linear park. So what is a linear park? The, here you have a map. Uh, we, you, you have already heard it was a railway, uh, it had a railway track and uh, it was used by uh, the industries that were located in this part of the city. Uh, when, uh, when I was saying there was the, uh, the strategy for development, uh, the search of the city of Belgrade for 2001, one of the key elements of this strategy was uh, to remove all uh, the, the, the uh, industry areas for, from this part and uh, uh, try to make it um, residential. So all the, uh, the railway tracks that, were, uh, that have been used for uh, these industrial uh, areas were not uh, uh, needed anymore and uh, now this currently devastated uh, uh, area will be transformed in the public park. Uh, the total area of uh, the park is 33 hectares. It is long for more or less 4.6 kilometers. And the whole plan, a uh, detailed regulation plan, is 46 uh, hectares uh, of space. Uh, well, uh, we, as you uh, maybe uh, you, you already understand, the, the huge impact that uh, the, the, the park will have uh, for the, all the citizens of Belgrade, not just the people in, the, in their surroundings. Uh, due to its uh, distinctive length, 4.7 kilometers, and small white, uh, we uh, divided this, uh, this, this area in 10 spatial and program zones. And uh, the Department of City Architect, where I take uh, my work, uh, organized uh, one invitation for the young professionals to participate and, uh, in multidisciplinary teams and to qualify, first of all, for the development of conceptual landscape design for Linear Park. Uh, we had a result that we had 10 teams uh, for uh, 55 young people uh, were in these 10 teams made of architects, urban planners, engineers, biologists and so on that they were selected. Uh, each team had one zone to, to make this uh, conceptual landscape design and they were supervised by the experts for the city assembly the eminent, eminent uh, architects, uh, the urbanists, representative for public institution, uh, and everything that they created uh, is uh, in one unique vision of landscape design for all the zones, which when assembled, like uh, one collage, will represent uh, diverse ideas and designs. 
And uh, now I will show you a video that we have presented, we have prepared to, to show what the linear park is going to more or less look like. Sorry for the Serbian, but everything is, what I've said already, is in this text. Okay, thanks also again to all the 55 people that were involved here. Thanks also, there are some members of the, of the Zone 8. Uh, well, the city of Belgrade is, uh, has two, uh, is a partner on two European projects, uh, Horizon 2020, which are dealing with the uh, Linear Park. Uh, Linear Park is their demo site. And uh, you have already heard something about uh, the Eupolis project from uh, Philip. Uh, 
Um, uh, it's not just the. Uh, it was uh, in early stages. It was planned to. It was planned to be that uh, Eupolis project will be uh, implemented in zone seven and eight. Uh, but uh, it's going to be in the whole park in the ways that we are trying to uh, uh, during the uh, during the uh, the documentation. Uh, uh, we will try to implement all the all the good knowledge that we receive from our police project. Uh, or the other is uh, the other Horizon 2020 project is Clever Cities. Well, Belgrade is a follower city. Uh, in this project, city leaders, are, city leaders are Hamburg, London and Milan, and they are designing and implementing uh, nature-based solutions in the key districts of their own cities for urban regeneration. And Belgrade is a partner, and we will collect all the good experience and uh, implement them uh, in the planning site of the linear park. To exchange between cities, inclusive collaboration and multifunctionally learning, the clever cities will uh, drive a new kind of nature-based transformation for sustainable and socially inclusive cities. We, uh, we, we, we implemented this concept uh, via wide expert and citizen engagement in various planning phases supported by the local partner sales for this clever city. Uh, when I was searching and studying about uh, the, the regenerative cities. I stumble on uh, the World uh, Future Council. Uh, there is one publication that they made uh, regenerative urban development a roadmap to the city we need. So I found what is this, what it makes the city regenerative. And they say these are benefits for the local environment and natural ecosystem, drive the local economy, improve neighborhood cohesion and health increase their own resilience and haste participatory decision-making. So let's see what Belgrade has uh, done with this. Uh, so benefits of the environment and natural ecosystems. Uh, I will read one part of, of this, uh, we'll try to understand. Uh, at the core of regenerative vision is to ensuring that future generation inherit a robust and intact world uh, in which they can realize their full human potential and the cities continue to provide opportunities for all the people to improve their quality of life. So uh, when we were uh, developing this, this uh, project, we, uh, and the project is not at the end, uh, we are still in the, uh, in the planning uh, uh, part of the project, uh, we will try to shorten the distance uh, we'll try, as you can see, these uh, uh, red uh, arrows. We'll try. Before it was uh, a railway, and just a few passages were able uh, to connect these two parts of the town. And now, uh, by shortening the distance, we will try to uh, to to use less energy to to connect these parts. Uh, and uh, we'll try also to promote urban and uh, peri-urban ag um, agriculture. Uh, in the linear park, we will have five uh, kilometers of cycle path. We will have 4.7 kilometers of uh, pedestrian uh, uh, and uh, 4.7 kilometers of uh, running pathway. Well, the other thing is to improve the neighborhood cohesion and health. As you can see, uh, it's, it, it, it is... Uh, the neighborhood that is not connected it's uh, very uh, diverse in the in the whole length of the of the park uh, uh, the diversity social diversity architectural diversity planning diversity everything is very different in, uh, uh, in between those uh, two areas so um, we think also that uh, in one part urban uh, agriculture will uh, as it proves in a lot of times uh, it will improve the uh, social cohesion and lower crime rates by enabling local residents to, pri to take pride and ownership of the community and their daily lives. Uh, well, the other thing is to drive the local economy. Uh, well, we are all sure that in comfortable spaces, public spaces, we, which are designed for everybody, uh, is used by everybody. Everybody is using 
uh, will use this park, and not just uh, people in their surroundings, but the people from, from Belgrade. Uh, and uh, it will benefit from its, I think that we will think that we will benefit from its social uh, uh, diversity and that uh, this agglomeration of people, sorry for this word, uh, it's very pandemic word, but it will uh, um, economically uh, uh, improve uh, and drive the local economy. So increased land value is just one side effect of, uh, of this regeneration. Uh, it, this project also needs to increase uh, its own resilience. I'm uh, showing this the picture of um, Zone 2, where we have uh, uh, one lower part uh, just uh, below the Nabusha Tower, uh, which is situated in the, on the uh, exact confluence of the, of the river Sava to Danube. And uh, we have a huge problem of uh, flooding in this place. So uh, the project needs to deal with uh, the resilience, not just for this place, but uh, this affects uh, uh, the other parts of Kalamegdan Fortress uh, on the other side of the, of the uh, protection wall. There is one, maybe you've uh, seen already, there is one hole for the cars just below the railway, the, the, the old railway. And uh, from this hole, the, when it flooded, it goes right through it and just flood the, the, the lower part of Kalamegdan Fortress. So also, we have to uh, enhance uh, the participatory decision making. Uh, we have the law on planning and construction, uh, and uh, it's. Um, uh, the participation of public is uh, in two steps. Uh, we have early public display and uh, then we have draft plan uh, public consultation. Uh, so we uh, recognize that the city needs more for uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of project and uh, it needs the, the new ways to address uh, the public to, to participate uh, in, in, uh, in all the decision making. Um, so uh, that's why the Belgrade became a partner for those, the, these two Horizon 2020 projects. And uh, we, in this project, we engage a lot together with, uh, with the partners, with other partners in the activities, interaction with the local stakeholders. Not just interaction, but we are uh, trying to define them. We try to find them. We uh, try to, to get them and to, to invite them to, to, to show them what is uh, all about. Uh, and uh, many of them already participated uh, in, in these uh, several uh, reunions. They were online uh, because of the situation and there were some uh, uh, local conference uh, uh, made for the Clever Cities. For Eupolis we didn't uh, have this kind of uh, possibility, but uh, we had uh, numerous uh, online conferences. So uh, both projects will uh, approach, uh, both projects approach already in some cases uh, cities with various uh, surveys and uh, uh, in which we try to inspire, to inspire and uh, to encourage to take the, the part in the process of altering their neighborhood. Uh, and uh, when you think, uh, when you go back to all the things that uh, the books, they, 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 that regenerative urban development, a roadmap to the city needs, uh, we, we checked all these this, uh, uh, boxes uh, from, from, from there. And uh, I think that uh, I, will, I will end my story with uh, one phrase from Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs is an American writer. Uh, she writes uh, a lot about the cities. And here uh, she wrote about this uh, what, they, what she thinks is a regenerative, a regenerative city. So, dull in our cities, it's true, do contain the seeds of their own destruction and little else, but lively, diverse, intense cities contain the seeds of their own regeneration with energy enough to carry over the, for problems and needs out, outside themselves. Uh, well, I think that Jane, in uh, her, her second phrase, uh, described uh, Belgrade as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too, Darko. Very, very informative lecture.
And I would also agree, yes, that Jane uh, uh, almost described Hungary as a lively, diverse and intense city, and I hope that uh, whoever comes from, from abroad to Belgrade can send this potentially. Though. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. We okay. will have uh, questions for you also at the round table. Okay. Any questions for Barbara from the audience? Not at this point. So we go further with um, continuing actually the story of, of these urban developments in Belgrade uh, with Ivana Korica and Una Korica. They are associate members of Serbia Radio de Council. Uh, Ivana is junior researcher at the University of Belgrade, Faculty of Architecture and student of doctoral academic studies of architecture and urbanism. And Una is a student of master of academic studies. And they uh, won this competition that Dr. Kohn uh, talked about for this line park in Belgrade and they will present it from their own angle uh, approach to, to these kind of projects and regenerative design. So Una and Ivana, please continue. Okay, let's just share the screen. So hello everyone. Uh, as it's mentioned, we are Ivana Korica and Una. She's my work partner and sister, and we're here as associate members of Serbia Grimbian Council. Uh, today we're going to speak about our experience in urban space transformation as a challenge for young talents. Um, the topic is Lenar Park Belgrade, as previously mentioned by uh, Darko and other members. It is uh, the park that's going to be built upon the old railway line. Uh, it spans approximately 4.6 kilometers and is about 46 acres in size. Uh, the project, again as mentioned, was divided in 10 zones, thus uh, nominated to 10 uh, teams of young Serbian architects. The zone that our team worked on, uh, well, actually before that, um, this is a, a picture you've seen before in some of the presentations, but let's go into detail a bit. Um, as any park, the predominant uh, function is nature and park area, of course, uh, playgrounds and such other functions. But within the Lenar Park of Belgrade, it's, um, it was very important to that there is also educational function that there is commercial zones, recreation area, and then in certain areas we have uh, focuses on culture, uh, as the Kalamagdan area up towards the Sava River, and then there is the most important uh, along the Leonard Park, is the old and actually first um, power plant on the uh, Marina d'Orcio. Here you can see the, the zone that was given to us, well, nominated, zone eight. Um, it's obvious that it's not really on the old railway line itself, uh, as the Zone 7 passes along it, but we are sort of parallel to it, so creating um, a specific space. Uh, hello, everyone. Now, our team was consisted of six members, each uh, originating from different backgrounds. We wanted to work diversely, so within our team we had a biologist, a landscape architect and the rest of us that were architects came from various fields from urban design to architectural design and even graphical design. Uh, from the very beginning it's important to mention we completely collaborated along every single step of the way and each contributed to the design process. This resulted in the end, the result, this led to the result we had in the end. Okay, so naturally we started with site analysis. Um, our location was epically placed because it was direct, it had direct connection to the main city square, the Republic Square, and it was the second closest location to the River Danube. Um, it was important to us from the very beginning um, to realize what the main communication through the zone would be. So we got the new uh, planned um, streets, the metro line, the green line here presented uh, top right corner is the uh, Zone 7 and the actual um, Leonard Park old railway line. Um, current use of the surrounding area of our zone is um, industrial and some mixed use. And according to plan, it will be only residential with some commercial zones uh, to the south, including a potential metro station. So at the bottom left uh, was our first sketch, our main idea. 
Um, the, di the diagram represents the, the key features we've all come together and realized were the most important for our zone. So we have the square, the field, the woods, the urban orchards, the urban gardens, commercial contents, water and lake. What is important to mention was that by the competition um, and, well, a suggestion, of course, um, the commercial content would not only be shops, but would also be uh, work such as little hubs or workshops. So something that's multifunctional and easily varied. Uh, alongside this, from the very beginning, we tried to get into the very detail of how imagined this space would become and look one day. And each of us had a vision and we put them together and these are the original sketches that you can find to the left of the screen uh, where some of us contributed with the idea of vertical gardens, some of us suggested a commercial open space or a simple clear meadow for relaxation. And uh, next to this we also instantly uh, started with various typologies from the visual communication levels that we wanted to achieve, experimenting with the terrain, to the hierarchy of trails. From the very beginning, we created a clear network of lines and paths that would later uh, construct the, the project, and we wanted to make it extremely available for all types of users, so user-friendly. Okay. Uh, this would be the conceptual design, the landscape or site plan. The four key features or macro segments as mentioned are the square, the lake, the woods, and the commerce, each divided and um, emphasized with micro segments. And I'll go through them, but through the location. So we'll start the tour at the very north. I hope everyone can see the mouse as I go. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah sure. Visible. Okay, so entering the zone um, eight, we come across the big square. Again, this was important to us here uh, as a relation to the Square of Republic. It's an in-between space, but again, it's, it's for everyone using the Leonard Park and again, for the res residents in the, in the area. Upon entering, we have a square, which is connected to zone seven with this amphitheater stairs. And moving along, you could see that there is a clear path, the main trail, it is the spine of our zone. And her, the, the hierarchy of it is such that other trails sort of, sort of embark and follow it. In the center, you can see that there is also another line, so to say, it is actually our water, water path, starting from the um, square, leading on to the rest of the zone. Uh, the middle is sort of engulfed in between hills, so to speak, to the um, south, which is to the zone seven. Our higher hills, more woodland, um, a bit of wilder nature, and to the other side, across from it, here, are smaller hills. So it is to create ambience, um, some sort of more intimate zone, atmosphere, and just a denivelation in terrain. Moving to the center, we have what appears to be a circle. It is a circular field. Um, it's engulfed uh, in, in, in high vegetation, meant to be a sort of seclusion area, somewhere to come, meet peace, feel um, displaced from the city, and hushed in nature. The main water line uh, ends up in what appears to be a lake, but also a building. It is the cultural uh, pavilion, which we'll be talking about later on. Moving along, uh, we have the urban orchards and the urban gardens. Again, we'll talk about them furthermore, but they're sort of compact and, and um, similarly placed. The zone ends, or again begins in another way, with the commercial square. Um, by commercial, uh, it's a set of pavilions with multifunctions later on presented. And as you can see, uh, the location is quite connected with its surrounding and each openings, beginning or end, as you wish to perceive it, are quite connected with the surroundings. So the flow of users and, and of all types um, are free to enter or exit as they please. What is important to mention as well here, well, you can see it, um, are the plenty of trails. So we have bike trails, trim trails, different pedestrian places as well as uh, an opportunity to explore natural, natural terrain as you please. Um, you may notice the blue spots around here. These are our water retentions as zone seven is quite high above us and the entire location of the Leonard Park is on the lower ground in comparison to the um, 
city center. Uh, the rainwater appears there and collects there, and instead of it being a problem, uh, floods and such, we have these natural retentions to keep the water, recycle it, clean it in natural ways, which could be later seen. So the site plan or aerial view, um, it's clear to notice the diversity in content, the ambience we try to create, uh, the nature-based solutions that, were, that are provided and are plenty, and the way it's integrated with its surrounding, and the culture that we try to recreate and perceive. Talking about culture and natural-based uh, solutions, it was really useful to us to, to work with biologists and a landscape architect, not only because our own knowledge widened up and, and we have new perspectives now, but because the plan of vegetation is one that's complete, fully analyzed, and quite clear, right? Yeah. We not only have a nice set of plants, trees, vegetations to improve the ambience, but each specific species has a reason to be placed where it is in terms of evergreens protecting from uh, summer heat to um, conifer conifers that in winter allow the areas to be warmed. Uh, also, we have wind retentions, but we'll talk about all of that later. What is quite important in this plan is that the vegetation used and applied was uh, specifically chosen to be native to Serbian region as to be more sustainable, more uh, constructive, and more lasting. Um, here are the diagrams of the uh, nature-based solutions and ecosystems. So this is the nature-based we were just talking about, but um, uh, broken down. So we have the reduction of noise and air pollution. Those would be the tall vegetations surrounding the zone, again, keeping certain winds, but then uh, letting certain other winds pass, and blocking the two streets that we have aligning us. The green roofs and rain collections were quite important as they are atop each pavilion, uh, providing a better, more sustainable surrounding. Regulation of the microclimate was very important to us because in each park uh, you have the potential for something to, to not feel as comfortable or as pleasant. Uh, in these areas, with the vegetation plan, we have created atmospheres that regulate on their own, that are specific for each place. So for example, on the hillsides, we have such vegetation that lets through um, fresh wind, but keeps the sunlight, again, keeping the roots of the hillside so that there is no um, slides off and, and such other. Um, the regulation of water regime, prevention of terrestrial floods, as I mentioned previously, the retentions, uh, you can find them um, throughout the entire location, but predominantly on the slopey sides. The conservation uh, of local biodiversity, this is relevant in terms of not only are we with this vegetation plan and park plan and design um, keeping and, and conserving the biodiversity present, but also we're bringing back the species that have migrated to the Great War Island, which is um, just across Danube. Um, and they, they, they have the potential to migrate back. And with the way we've designed the park, they have clear, safe paths to migrate through and populate the area. Uh, the urban gardens and urban orchards, as we've said, are sort of concentrated. Um, that is not um, the negative side of it. In fact, it's quite positive. Um, they're placed there as presentation points information points and education points um, to just emphasize that uh, having urban gardens, uh, locally grown food, and the zero kilometer food concept are quite important and actually useful and pleasant to use. Um, this is... Um, someone, someone's microphone is on. Uh, anyways, in, in the bottom uh, right corner, you can see the way it would look. Okay. Sorry, the, someone's mic is on? Sorry, it's showing that Natasha has their microphone on? Okay. okay. 
Okay, next to all this, uh, the pavilions that we mentioned, they had a typology of their own. So here you can see them represented in an axonometric view. They ranged in size from quite large to much smaller, but alongside this, they also had their own diversity from purpose and uh, integrated aspects of sustainable design. So if we look at the first one, the biggest one, it was designed to be an outdoor open working space that in the winter months could be closed as on the picture to the right. Uh, we wanted to create a sort of like hub-like co-working open space that could be found within the park and promote this uh, idea of working outside and creating within the nature. Type 2 is a much smaller pavilion. It is almost a stand. It could be a food court, a shop, an ice cream shop as shown. Uh, type 3 is an outdoor public toilet, something that is so often overlooked in parks. Uh, type 4 is a much smaller outdoor seating with a rooftop. And types 5 and 6 have a characteristic feature that they are actually constructed from a frame and within themselves have the typology of varying by purpose. Uh, here you can see some of them. Uh, so from an outdoor library for book exchange to these uh, spatial toys both for children or simply more mobile furniture such as swings or this uh, outlined bench. We also wanted to create a specific type which is 6.6 .6, and that is an insect hotel integrated also insects within our design. And here you can see that again as one of the key features of the sustainable regenerative and nature-based design within the pavilions. So all of them have uh, green rooftops, crucial, and most of them have the uh, green walls with a specific irrigation system to save water. Uh, we also wanted to address the materials used. We wanted the materials to have a very low carbon footprint, so we used a lot of wood. And also within our design, we wanted to suggest the reuse, upcycling, and recycling of materials. So for the covers, for the seating, we wanted to use plastic which also to the eye has a very attractive pattern range and could be soft and a very good outdoor material. As for the previously mentioned insect hotel, um, it is basically um, bringing back nature into the project and it is made up of materials which are completely natural. Now the cultural pavilion, um, it's completely unique by form and differs from the others. And it was actually inspired by the traditional way that you can find pavilions within Serbian parks. They're designed like a little um, display that can be observed even without actually entering the pavilion itself. So we wanted it to be um, completely designed from scratch by nature. We used the sun path to decide which way it would be oriented. It is very transparent and open. Uh, wind flows through easily. And perhaps what speaks for it best is the final renders, where you can see that light is reflected with the inner part of the rooftop and back into space. Um, as I mentioned, airflow is clear. We're using water to create a very comfortable, uh, comfortable environment, and it is extremely transparent. OK, here you can see um, some of our renders. They show our park ambience. Uh, what was also a bit of a key feature uh, is our natural monument. So in the main square, instead of having a man-built um, monument, we have a natural one. It is a tree, um, and it also is the beginning of our water flow. Uh, yeah. yeah, and perhaps these photos all speak best for themselves. You can see that clearly we wanted to design with the nature and use it as the key element. And this water path is there to create the flow, whereas the flow can itself be seen from all the tree lines as well. This is one of our favorite uh, renders uh, because it's so down to earth. It's so um, calm. It's full of nature, different vegetation, and it's something that invites everyone to build in nature-based solution way, a more sustainable, regenerative way. It's quite simple. It just takes some um, informa information from uh, different professions and a little bit of design work. Uh, as a summary, here we have a video of our zone. The lessons we learned uh, as young architects and young professionals and the opportunity of a competition for Leonard uh, Park Belgrade was enormous. Um, We've learned plenty of things from each other, from the theme, from uh, the key points. Our eyes are now further open to sustainability, to regenerativeness, to nature-based solutions. Um, it was an important thing for us and a huge step. And 
perhaps most important of all this collaboration that we had with other professions is something that we will carry on into every further project and has been, as Ivana said, an eye-opener and a truly rare opportunity to achieve this and to take it further. It's uh, quite a big invitation that further plans and competitions are require actually a multidisciplinary team and yep that's right so yeah thank you for your attention if thank you there, very much if there are any questions <laughs> we have a clap <laughs> thank okay. you thank you very much thank you thank you for uh, yes i think you and i do not demonstrate that uh, we've been talking about and this is this uh, Let's say, well, let's call it a fragment of systems thinking and, of course, multi, uh, multidisciplinary and uh, approach to, to designing urban spaces. So now we will take a break of five minutes, just that our speakers can actually come to the table where we will have a few questions for them uh, in our next and uh, concluding uh, session of round table. So five minutes break and speakers, please. Approach. Hear me also over the Zoom as well as in the room. So uh, I would uh, start the session of just a few questions for our local speakers, uh, which would be interesting both for local and uh, audience that we have uh, on Zoom. But I would start with Jovan, since Jovan is not physically with us. Jovan, are you with us? Unmute, unmute, please. Okay, I'm, I'm not absent, I'm present. <laughs> <laughs> just not, yes, just not physically. Well, Jovan, I will start with you uh, and ask you, uh, since you are a practitioner, obviously, a designer, uh, maybe you can say for us something more about, more in details about methods, processes or tools uh, that you would like to emphasize and that you use in your design project, uh, projects and processes in order to achieve either regenerative or sustainable goals in both urban or architectural context? Okay, uh, I'm some kind of uh, analog, not digital person. I'm not very uh, skills in computer because that's what I'm uh, working for more than 25 years is just uh, as a design, like chief designer or developer and everything, project manager. And I haven't uh, time to go through all these skills. And I keep all tools, I mean, see the tools, the architectural tools, just the hand and the pencil. And uh, I think that is the very important Although we use many technical things that uh, keeping a pencil as an architect uh, and is a direct contact with the brain and it keeps the motoric and intellectual work, work uh, very good and very precise. Uh, I suggest to all young architects to use as much as they can the pencil or pen or whatever they use. If we are speaking about practical tools. If you are speaking about tools in design process, uh, also, also I'm much more uh, based my uh, tools on knowledge I get from the books, but I means by the knowledge, not information. And when I try to get into some process, I'm trying to go deeply in the method, but always try to find uh, on the sticks between two science, sciences means it's not easy to get deep if you are going deep and deep deeper in one field then you are go just deep but if you want to find solutions really solutions you have to combine the different uh, methods and different sciences uh, also i'm using lots lot of in intuition and also i'm listening my uh, experience. When you are experienced, then you are a little bit less uh, in possibility to, to jump in something new because you know what are you expecting in front. This is some kind of break 
and, I, and that's lucky for the young people that they are not they have the break from the experience and when you find the balance between experience and uh, some kind of creativity then you will get the best results according to this project i explained today the most uh, questions was how can i get to these uh, results from the pro process mostly by uh, questioning what is the best solution to keep the site and the place uh, as much as is possible natural and to keep the nature as it possible and to involve in this uh, projects inside and to get some uh, coordination between uh, artificial and natural things. If you use artificial things in the nature, they should be not aggressive. And that's my, uh, some kind of cradle. Is enough explanation? Yes, yes. Uh... Uh, thank you for an elaborative answer. I think you mentioned all, uh, all how to say, actual topics uh, also in design today, nowadays, and that is this uh, balance, as you said, especially now at the end, as you said, the artificial and natural systems and how they actually intertwine. So I think, uh, uh, I think these are all still topics that will be, uh, that will be developing. Uh, uh, into 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 further let's say fields and also expertises will be developing from everything that uh, that artificially is going on and nature will be will be always there and it's just the creativity forces that will be that will be creating this uh, this let's say balance and this uh, these connections between everything we do I, I just want to add something some one one short thing uh, this hard time and uh, burden time, burden time in ways that uh, in the, this pandemic uh, show us that the uh, uh, the connection with the nature is very important, and the way how we treat the na uh, the nature and how we uh, treat ourselves uh, as a part of the nature, it's uh, then it brings us the possibility to survive. I mean, it's not just biologically, but also mentally, and also to survive as a civilization these challenges will be more and more and uh, how we will uh, answer these challenges it depends also from our uh, field of work from architecture and i think that the uh, very density urban place will be have to be changed in the future because it will be for possibility disaster points in the future for such kind of things and reurbanization in a way to keep uh, nature as possible and to reunite your people uh, with the nature will be the next goals for also for us, for us as an architect to find the way how we will treat this uh, not only an architect but urban planners together how can we solve these problems yes exactly you you said it uh, properly yes pandemics also brought some new already some new topics and as you said uh, how we treat ourselves and how we treat nature is really something that we have to, to think about. And uh, also with these limitations, for example, of movements, I think that uh, within, uh, let's say, three or five kilometers reach, uh, there should be always some nature available to us as not, not all of us are able to actually move and go to nature. So we really have to, uh, again, go back to the scale and, 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 uh, and, uh, really uh, how to say, uh, how to say uh, nurture ourselves with the nature available to us at a walking distance of course this is not an easy task but uh, but possible possible task to to achieve for everybody from the implementation sector from design sector from everybody so thank you Jovan very much very nice uh, very nice uh, very uh, uh, very not philosophical, but let's say very um, very inspirational guidelines from you. Of course, uh, you are very holistic. I would say in your practice, as you really think about both human and nature and the built environment. And thank you for doing that and promoting this kind of practice uh, in our regions. Thank you, Jovan, very much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So now we continue with some other other areas of, 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 of urban practice and we can from from the design process switch to this let's say uh, life uh, life uh, life uh, life of the buildings and and this uh, lifespan 
So we go to Martin Elezovic to actually ask him, okay, so we designed the building and now we have the facility management uh, to deal with its life and with its efficiency. So uh, what do you think, how can facility management impact restorative and sustainable buildings and operations in contexts of Serbia? What would you say in, in realm, let's say, of facility management? Uh, thank you. Well, uh, buildings use energy when they are in function, when they operate. If, they, if there are not people inside, and if nobody is using those buildings, they will consume zero energy. So basically, in the modern buildings, what we have is a function of facility management team who is uh, managing and operating the building. Uh, I think it's very important that that team has significant knowledge how to deal with the modern buildings. And in Serbia this is this is new, you know, so basically maybe the last 20 years we are getting modern buildings more intensively and uh, uh, there is uh, a strong demand for uh, professionals in that field who can operate it in the proper way. Otherwise, if not, simply, uh, even, even if you have a good design, but if you are operating in the wrong way, you will make the damage. And this is, this is something that is, uh, what is certainly uh, something that what we need. And uh, on the state level, I believe we need to think about that to educate professionals in that field because currently we don't have an efficient program for that, so basically people are only by doing things. And uh, uh, on the other hand, I think we need to change, we need to change the uh, way how it's done, because currently it's a price-driven mechanism, uh, asking for the cheapest price possible. This leads to negative selection of the people who are working with that. So if you really want to have high skilled professionals who are working there, it should be a rethink over and then to give them a proper proper space where they can really do something. Uh, by doing the life cycle analysis, this is my let's say point to the previous uh, presentations. Uh, with life cycle assessment, uh, you can see that the building uh, a large margin is contributing to the environment during the operational phase. Uh, maybe energy is about 70 or something, 70, 75. And maintenance is next 10, 15, 20 percent. Construction cost, the whole construction impact is about 20, 25 maybe max. So basically you can easily see that in operation, which you know, could last 50, 60 years, the majority of impact of the buildings is happening. We simply cannot deploy it, and people who are dealing with that are facility managers, so we need to give them a proper position in, in the whole approach if we want to carry a the approach to the sustainable future. Yes, yes, exactly, as you, as you said, this um, negative selection could be, a, of course, a problem, but what do you think, uh, what can be done in order to increase the number of sustainable buildings, certified buildings in Serbia? Well, well they, of course, there are some regulatory frameworks which can emphasize and simply require this. It could be started by uh, certain type of the buildings, for example, important buildings or uh, about certain size and so on. But those are the, I believe, hard measures. It could be done even with some soft measures. So, but if, for example, uh, government and local authorities, they need to understand that those companies who are pursuing uh, building certifications, they are doing significantly much more work compared to other uh, non certified buildings. I think they need to be awarded. The award could be a small, could be a small city office, for example, some, some person in the, in the city who can solve their problems. For them, this would be a huge help, for example. Mm -hmm. Not to be, maybe, maybe to be in front of getting some papers from the local authorities. So there is no cost with that, but simply to speed up 
their processes so that they can offset additional costs which they have. And by this, I think this would be, this would be, let's say, increased. Currently, you have a market, market-driven uh, uh, approach, basically, that, that the market is asking for that more and more. New tenants are coming and asking if we have certain capability and things like that. So basically, or competition is doing this and then you see, okay, I must do this as well. But this process is slow, you saw the percentages. So if you want to yes. it up, you need to, to look for the benefits of, of those people who are doing it. Those are investors and how we can help them simply to implement it more. On the state level, yeah, it's clear what you need to do to make a decision to implement on all of their buildings. So this would be great, but Yes, yes, we have to obviously think, of course, long term, not only short term or, 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 or uh, benefits or what is maybe cheaper at the moment. Yeah, but when you, when you start to have more of those buildings, so you will have skilled designers who know how to do this. Of course. You have contractors who will know how to build that. Yeah, yeah. After that, you have facility management teams who can operate that. So basically, you're making the whole supply chain of building, and then you can simply have something what we are, let's say, speaking here. So mm. otherwise, otherwise, you know, it's, with, with buildings, it's clear. So basically, we have clear figures. We have temperature rise. We have maybe mm -hmm. 1.5 degrees rise. We have increase of gray greenhouse gas emissions by this percent. Doing this in that way, buildings we can reduce by 5%, we can reduce by 10%, we can, we can have precise figures how we will reduce impact on the environment. And the math is clear, you so need just to, to, to support it and to, to jump on it, otherwise it's unsustainable. So simply by, by all the exponential growth of almost all parameters, it's, it's clear that this is not going anywhere. Yes. Or we will be waiting for some catastrophic event and then everything will be changed on the other side. Let's see. Yes, yes, let's, let's see. Uh, you mentioned, of course, uh, uh, of course, we all, all have to exchange, of course, knowledge between yes and disciplines and all different, uh, let's say, stakeholders in the life cycle of, of actually building, uh, uh, of, of building, um, how would I say, functioning, yes. And uh, transferring then from this this uh, this uh, discussion to to something that F Philip can tell us is um, again maybe connected to 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 this uh, one part let's say of these sustainable buildings and that are uh, that are green roofs and about them I would ask uh, how do you think we can promote them more in 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 the region and implement it and do you think they should be regulated by law possibly and and why. Yeah, I definitely think they should be regulated by law because, I, as, as I said uh, in my presentation, so we can promote them uh, through, I don't know, urban farming and urban gardening and so those, those things can, can help for sure, but if we will really want to have some benefit from, from green roofs, I think they need to be uh, regulated by law. I, I believe it's the same thing with other nature-based solutions. I, I can talk to, about green roofs because I was, I was investigating them and, and working on them. Uh, so yeah, I think if, I, I'm basically I'm sure that if you have green roofs, for example, you know, occasionally just here and there, you, you don't get any benefit from neither in terms of reduction of the runoff, neither in terms of reduction of pullback in effect. So basically you're you're not you're not doing anything mostly. So if you want really to have a benefit from free roofs you need to regulate them below so they need to be for example you, you make a law that every new building needs to have green roof on, mm -hmm. on the top. It's a similar thing now nowadays in, in Belgrade where every building has to have a underground garage. Mm. So something similar should be done, for example, uh, with, with green roofs. And I think the additional, the additional good thing uh, for Belgrade is that all buildings are also there 
they're designed to, 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 to carry on additional load. So they're well designed so you can even put green roofs on, on some old buildings. So, and for example, if you, have, if, if you think that the load will be too significant, there are ways to, so the substrate can be very light. So uh, in, in, on my PhD, I, I was working on the, some volcanic substrate that has some organic matter, so uh, grass can grow on it, but again, it doesn't produce any significant load mm -hmm. on the roof construction. So there are ways to, to make it even on all buildings. Also, it doesn't, it's not necessary to, to, for the roof to be totally flat. Uh, green roofs can be done also on the, so I did it on the baby sheet roof, it can be, uh, of course, there is some critical inclination, but it, it can be done also on, on many different uh, roof types. So, yeah, there are, for sure there are ways to, to, to do it, but I believe they need to be regulated by law, and only like that they can make it some impact, some significant impact that can be noticed. Otherwise, uh, I, otherwise I think it will not be so useful. Yes, yes, you uh, said again one very um, useful information and that is again, um, how to say, regarding scale. If we use just, as you said, here or there some roof, we don't do nothing. So again, we have to come back to this scale of few kilometers, let's say, the range and how many maybe green roofs we can have in this, in this exact scale or a scale of a district. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. each, I guess. Sub, like uh, urban subcatchment scale, so it needs to be uh, yeah, let's say major, maybe not majority, but at least some significant percentage of buildings need to have it green roofs if we want to see some some benefit. Yes, yes, and it's uh, it's not only benefit uh, even in how to say in climate mitigation, but also for the well-being of participants, yeah, for yeah. activities that could be taken, yeah, yeah. and also let's say the, the 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 overall image of the city and and. And uh, its attractiveness to also maybe foreign, uh, foreign let's say tourists, and it can be also branding. There is a lot of actually benefits that we can extract from there. So thank you, Philip, for sharing this with us. But we go back then to uh, maybe another topic, and that is um, that's it. That is a, a, a topic of of uh, actually doing this all in phases, and all these have certain costs and similar similar things. Uh, so I would like to ask Darko. So I would like to Darko, uh, what uh, more to tell us more, about, more in detail about city plans. We saw very informative, uh, very informative lectures about Belgrade, uh, Belgrade future developments, considering, for example, line parks. So uh, how are you managing these phases of the project? Where are you now? Which are phases to come? And uh, possibly the cost of this urban intervention. Uh, this is the most difficult and most expensive question. <laughs> uh, well, uh, the linear park uh, is in, uh, on the video. Uh, it's uh, from 21 to 23, maybe to 24. Um, it's a three-year project. Uh, now, currently, we are in the state of, um, uh, of designing the uh, urban plan, the detailed regulation plan for linear park. Uh, it is uh, almost done. By the Urban Institute of Belgrade, and I think that uh, it will be around, it will be on the, on the session of the uh, city assembly in August, more or less. Uh, we think that uh, it will pass because it's something which is uh, very procedural, Belgrade. And uh, with this, we have, uh, uh, we have an ability to start on the project phase. Uh, designing the project documentation. So um, we were uh, now in planning uh, the, the phases of, of the project. Uh, we are planning that uh, Zone 1 and Zone 2 will be the first phase of the project and they will start uh, building this in the uh, beginning of 2022. Uh, in 21, we think we will have uh, also the project, maybe not for the whole uh, park, but uh, for the Zones one and two. Uh, these zones are uh, the interesting one because they make a part of the Belgrade Fortress, and the plan is to uh, reconstruct the. Uh,
Okay, so sorry. We no, sorry. Have the, the outer layer of the, of, the, of the wall of the fortress. Uh, there also has to be some uh, archaeological excavations and uh, a lot of things that needs to be done. In this part, uh, also we have some uh, with the velvet uh, uh, greenery. Uh, they have their own. Uh, th this is the part of the, the area where they. of this part and then we think that uh, it's very plausible for them to to, uh, to start the project from these phases one and two. Phases one and two the cost uh, will be around six million euros mm -hmm. and uh, the whole park will be about around 60 million euros. It's a very uh, it's some estimated that is uh, we don't have a, uh, yet a regulation plan so we don't have a, uh, exactly. a project we don't know exactly how much it will cost. Uh, and then by continuing uh, the zones, uh, 3, 4, 5 and 6 will be the next zones. Uh, and then at the end in 2023 or beginning of 2024, uh, we will start with the zones of uh, 7, 8, 9 and 10. Uh, it's all going to be very difficult to organize this because um, zones 1 and 2 are uh, in the part where Belgrade is the owner of the land. And uh, the other zones, they have uh, very heavy uh, problems with uh, the ownership. Uh, so the dynamics will be also, uh, will be in case of solving all these problems. Uh, zone in the, in the third phase, they're the biggest problems <laughs> with this. And also we have a Belgrade metro station, uh, two, Belgrade, uh, two metro stations in uh, zone 9 and 10. Uh, so the construction also will be uh, uh, will be depending by the, the construction of the of the metro. Uh, so at the end, it's a 60 million euro project. Uh, now we have uh, succeeded in uh, we're closing the deal with the EBRD for uh, the first phase of the of the investments uh, with the uh, Ministry of uh, European Integration. We are trying to. Uh, to uh, apply for the EPI funds and uh, we are uh, expecting to receive at least a half of uh, the remaining uh, uh, 50, uh, six, 54 uh, million euros and uh, at the rest of the, third, uh, the phase uh, 3 we will try to uh, invest the, the money from the budget and maybe take some uh, money from the uh, again with, uh, with the EPID and uh, we think that uh, as I said in the, uh, in the my presentation we have a lot of um, uh, private investors that are uh, building around uh, this linear park uh, one of them uh, already paid for the uh, these young architects uh, to to uh, develop these uh, designs. Uh, so we guess that as we uh, construct the, 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 the phases that uh, more and more uh, investors will come and donate money for, for the, this investment, I think, uh, because it will uh, certainly uh, make a huge quality to, to their own uh, development. Yes, exactly, exactly. Well, uh, as a resident of Belgrade, I'm very, very eager to, to see and to experience all, all designs of this park and also everything that you've been preparing. I think this uh, was always discussed since I was in the studies that this railway is going uh, one day to be, to be something uh, very, how to say, um, very um, attractive and very, uh, very, uh, as w that will bring value also to the nearby land and things like that. And finally we are going to see it, as you say, by... It was a, a, a plan of the former uh, uh, city uh, city architect to bring the viewers of video retro uh, uh, architecture studio, uh, and uh, they were here in Belgrade. They studied a lot uh, about the site, uh, but the uh, there were also some negotiation to do some more uh, things in, uh, uh, in Croatia. And in this case, uh, the, the uh, and, and the uh, 
concentration camp. Uh, and at the end, their offer was uh, very high for the city of Belgrade. Uh, and we, just to uh, inform this new figure, Efron was uh, the designer of the Highline Park in, in New York, which is more or less uh, the same idea of, uh, uh, of regenerating something what was infrastructure and make it, uh, uh, make it green. Uh, so transforming uh, uh, gray to green, uh, it, it was their, their job. So but the, the offer that they, they made uh, was unacceptable and then uh, we uh, moved with the new uh, city architect. We moved it and tried to make this happened with uh, young architects and I think we did it very well. Yes, yes, as we heard from Ivana and Duna, it looks it's going to be uh, successful. So when you talk about the young, uh, young talent here in Serbia, and I am sure we have it uh, quite a lot. So what do you think? Uh, uh, do you think that it is important, how and why, of course, to include young experts in process of not only design, but the decision making? regarding sustainable and regenerative practices? Well, I think I speak for both of us when mm -hmm. I say this. Um, not only because we get to learn more, but also because we have some new, maybe modern, um, innovative perspective or ideas that could um, improve the plants, improve the, the mandatory things, maybe shift them, um, align them in new perspectives. And mainly uh, to see how things work and to be able to think in advance, think in the future of how to even do those things. So not only uh, are we giving ideas and we're learning, we're improving the system and changing it for better, I think. Yes, yes, well, young people always have, uh, let's say, fu futuristic uh, visions and I'm happy that we, we, we have you collaborating on, on projects like this. So, what would uh, present a challenge for you? What would uh, represent a challenge for you, let's say, regarding urban renewal strategies, as this is, in a way, uh, urban renewal strategies and approaches? What is, what, uh, what is, let's say, a perfect challenge for you as, as young talents? Well, perhaps the newly mentioned urban plan for Belgrade for 2041, it would be amazing if there would be a chance for more collaborations, such as the Linear Park has been, where we could bring input with perhaps more experimental ideas that are in a way fresh, and on top of the more traditional and base, they could uh, contribute to a completely original and unique idea. Yeah, and, and once again, it would be another milestone for us to, to see and experience. Yes, it is very important for young people to get chance to actually actually uh, really do something in practice at such young age to actually implement some projects. I'm very happy also that I heard from you that you had uh, also people from like uh, bi bi bio uh, uh, yeah. faculty of biology, then forestry. It's all the disciplines important, of course, for what you're doing and that is implementing in a proper way nature-based solutions. And uh, as maybe a concluding question, what would you say as, as, as you are still in an educational system, right? Uh, one at the doctoral studies, right, and one at the master uh, studies. Uh, what would you, let's say, add or change or propose to, uh, to, to, let's say, sustainable education and in Serbia or even outside? Well, I think it would be great if we would uh, integrate a one case study or a studio or workshop in between different faculties. So if it was mandatory to have a studio with landscape architects or biologists, uh, on the other hand, it would, be, it would be very useful to get feedback from already um, functioning organizations. So instead of just having internships, that they come towards the faculty, give lectures, hold workshops, like the government. Um, it's, th there's a growing gap in between um, which realistic have functions and what, as you said, uh, we have futuristic ideas. So somehow finding a, a level, a, an immediate ground um, to see how things function and be able to, well, dream upon them, uh, to come up with new ideas and actually see how things work. And also get an opportunity to widen our views, right? So we're studying and we're already learning things. Why not widen that to a better level so that we can, in fact, 
um, bring a more sustainable future or more regenerative or any of those terms really because they're very important. Yes, also circular and all, all the other, all, all the other, of course, uh, things that are important. Yes, I think you said also something that we all experienced uh, uh, when studying, and that is this, uh, let's say, slight disconnection between academia and industry or practice in any of its bodies or, let's say, uh, uh, or let's say, stakeholders. So I completely, of course, agree with you that. Um, uh, these internships should be uh, maybe uh, how to say proposed in a, in a different way and of course some very down to earth knowledge from practice uh, brought to students in a much more maybe efficient and uh, let's say approachable and available uh, available way so thank you thank you to all our speakers we are a little bit late with our schedule but i think we had a fruitful discussion and I think we made a slight roadmap to all of us and to all the audience that followed us about the state of uh, regenerative discourse in Serbia and also uh, I think that we, uh, that we uh, learned from Restore. I think we le learned from Restore a lot and I hope we will implement it in also uh, some of our practices here at a local level. Thank you very much everybody and I will give the word to Tatiana just to conclude uh, this today's conference. More presentation. <laughs> presentation? <laughs> yes, Jelena. <laughs> um, so we came to our last presentation. It's, uh, I'm calling uh, Jelena Blazifer from Faculty of Civil Engineering from University of Zagreb. Uh, she was the Science Communication Manager uh, together with Daniel Friedrich from Mosbach University in Germany. So please, uh, Jelena, do we Hi, hear you? Hi, hello, can you hear me? Okay, please. Okay, I hope you can see my slides, and since we are running a bit behind the schedule, I will try to keep it, uh, keep it short. So this last presentation is actually intended to, to uh, uh, give some more insight in how we communicate the Restore Scientific Output, where you have heard a lot about the outputs from different VGs, but I will try to summarize very, very briefly where you can find them, what actually is produced. Um, so the, the, the majority of the work is done by Daniel Friedrich, who is the Restore Scientific Communication Manager of the entire action. I am the communication team member, so I was supporting him in, in, in doing this work. Very briefly, this presentation will include just a few facts and figures about the Restore, uh, some of the most important activities that were done over the past four years. Then I will proceed with the reports and booklets, the printings that were produced as a dissemination uh, activities within the action. I will specify one particular um, uh, output <clears throat> called Atlas of Solutions. I will also refer to the printings that are still um, in the planning stage, while well, more or less uh, many of them are finished, but they are still not published. They will be very, very soon. And then I will give some concluding remarks on how to, to even though the action itself is ending, how we hope that the restore action and its outcomes, its findings will live on and how they might be turned into practice. So uh, uh, since this is about how we communicate out our outputs, I would like to emphasize that the major hub for all the communication, for all the, 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 the publications that were produced for actually all dissemination activities is, of course, our website, the, the, the Cost Action Restore website. Um, and the action itself is very, very large. It actually has over 160 members from 40 countries. And what is very important, they come from both academia and industry. And not only that, but they come with very, very different expertise. So from very different competence field, which I think is quite challenging to manage the project, but I think it is very, very beneficial because it enables um, to, to confront different views, different expertise, and have a really holistic research. Um, the, the, the research work itself within the cost action restore was done by five working groups. 
uh, what else has been done? There were um, uh, five academic training schools, so one for each of the working groups. There was an industry workshop for industrials. <clears throat> there were a number of scientific missions which were intended to interconnect universities. Um, there was the funding of conference participation through ITC. There was funding of journal publications through OA grants. Uh, one important initiative that I think was quite emphasized is the idea to carbon offset of all of the travels within the action, which is, of course, something that is very much in line with what we are actually researching and what we are hoping to achieve. And just to, to give an idea of how much, uh, how many meetings were needed to, to, to develop all these activities and perform all the work. There were five management committee meetings, there were five, 50 core group meetings, and there were really countless subgroup meetings. Nowadays, uh, towards the end of the action, mo most of them were, of course, online due to the uh, COVID situation, but at the beginning of the action, many of them were done uh, in person. Regarding the printings, the, the, the most important are the booklets which were produced by each of the five working groups. As I have said, the research work itself was done with the, uh, within the working groups. So the working group one uh, produced its booklet in 2018. And the idea was to, to differentiate between sustainability, restorative sustainability, or regenerativity. So it provided really a basis for the work of the subsequent working groups. But each working group produced a, a booklet summarizing um, the, the outcomes uh, which were specific to, to, to their work. So for the rigid group, uh, for the working group two, it was restorative design published in 2019, really a beautiful and very um, useful publication with over 400 pages. From the working group three, we have a publication on restorative building and operations from 2019. For working group four, there is a booklet on rethinking technology. It was published last year. And the last, but of course not the, le not the least, working group is the one on the scale jumping. Uh, and the, publica it, the publication is prepared and it will be very soon published. You, you will be able to find it on our website. To summarize the entire work, so the work from all five VGs, uh, uh, a final book is planned. <clears throat> So this will be uh, over 300 pages uh, prepared by 37 authors. So really comprehensive work, giving all the major outputs of the entire action. It is in the final stages, so we hope that it will be published soon. Uh, one specific output that I mentioned here, uh, specific in terms that it was actually the, the output of uh, working group four, is the Atlas of Solutions. You can also find it on the EU Restore website. So basically this is an interactive map which um, uh, provides structured overview of the technologies for improving indoor environment quality on 36 case studies, most of them in Europe, but not only in Europe, but, on, uh, but some on, on other continents. You can find them on the website, under deliverables and under tools. Um, over the entire action, the, the, the idea on how to um, announce the news to all the participants in the action, and you have seen that there is really a lot of them, but not just the participants of the action, but all the other interested parties. Uh, the idea was to produce regularly the newsletter, and this is quite a collection now, because uh, a newsletter was released each month, so there is over 40 of them now. So what they include is the review of the activities that were finalized. It um, disseminates, it, it lists disseminations that are knowledge and restore. It provides details of management decisions, but it also announces future work. So planned restore activities, paper calls that are relevant, um, announces relevant congresses, member nominations, and so forth. As I have said, there are still some things that are underway. First of them, is the publication Restory, Managing a Cost Action as a Project. So it is again a printed book, which actually is supposed to, to, to provide more in information on how to manage a project like a cost action. So it will give project presentation, chronological overview of activities, 
and most importantly, lessons learned from the action. The other publication is Restore 2030, City Following Restore Philosophy. So the idea is to, to take the outcomes of Restore and apply it on a, a, a larger scale, also to, to, to serve as a dissemination package with training and workshop guidance material. So it can also support schools, academia, practice. So to put actually the out, uh, outcomes uh, of, the, of the action into an example that can be used in practice. All the outputs are freely available for use. <clears throat> so they are very different. There are books, graphics, videos, presentations. Uh, for academia, it might be important that most of these outputs, these documents are scientifically citable. Uh, even though we are at the end of the action, we still uh, expect to, to further update the website with the new publications, news, any news that we uh, might want to communicate to the interested parties. So all of these news are announced on the Restore landing page, but we will also announce the papers that are still coming out that acknowledge the action, uh, if there are some congresses that might be of interest, but also the notifications on planned joint research projects. So the idea is, even though the action is coming to the end, to, to really uh, use the, the outputs, which are very, uh, which there are a lot of them, and I think they are very, very useful, but how to put them into the practice. So several proposals for practical applications. First, students for, uh, can, for example, conduct technology assessments from the Atlas of Solutions that I mentioned. <clears throat> Lecturers can create their core script with contents from the uh, working group booklets. Uh, Restore Final Book can be an inspiration for industrial managers to really reorient their business. Project managers can take into account the experiences from the Restore Book when planning the activities. Universities can also expand the teaching concepts from the, uh, from the booklets. And the Restore 2030 Book can be used by public authorities, politicians, and humanists to draw inspiration on how to proceed. So I tried to really keep this short. So even though, so just to emphasize that even though the action is coming to the end, you can still stay connected. You can always contact us with any questions at the, at the email, but you can also follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, and there is also a dedicated profile, profile on the research gate. So with this, I will conclude and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Yelena, uh, for a very informative presentation about summarize the results of the Restore. Uh, do we have any questions for Yelena? I have one for you. Regarding uh, practical application, do you succeed to use any of the tools or outcomes in your daily practice with the students? Um, I use them mostly, uh, well, I would, I use them mostly in lectures. So just to inform them of the, well, of the outputs of the uh, new possibilities of the new ideas and so on. I didn't, well, at least in the courses at, that I teach at the university, I didn't put them in the practical application that the students are actually, um, uh, you know, developing something. I still keep it more on the informative side, but I think there are uh, definitely other courses um, that that are developing more on those. I'm not saying at my university, but I know some other people who were uh, involved in the, in the cost action restore uh, that are doing that. Do you use maybe Atlas of Solutions? Um, I know that Daniel Friedrich uh, was using it with some of his students. I plan to do that with the next generation, but at the moment, uh, uh, so, but so far, uh, uh, I didn't give them that assignment. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much once more, Yelena. Um, so we came uh, almost to the end uh, of this event. Uh, I would say that we had very insightful and very inspirative uh, conference today. Uh, I can also say 
that we uh, learn something. Uh, we learn that uh, doing more meaning be regenerative, uh, providing restorative and positive effect to, to people, to the, our planet and society. And uh, in uh, regarding Serbia and our situation here, we can say also that maybe we are still far away from this kind of paradigm shift, but uh, still we can do something. We can enlarge our network with uh, brilliant people like uh, researchers uh, within the project Restore. Also, we can enlarge our knowledge about uh, regenerative and uh, restorative sustainability, and we can start to use it uh, in everyday activity. So at this point, I would like also to thank all our speakers and all our contributors. Uh, also, many thanks to Eurac from Bolzano and Carlo Battisti, who was the chair of this action, and who managed in, in the way that it was really a great pleasure to be a part of this project within the whole uh, life, uh, I mean, all these four years uh, of the project Restore. Also, I would like to, to invite you, if you would like to help us uh, with our aim to be a first uh, carbon neutral uh, European network, and to use instructions I saw in the link, uh, where you can try to find it on our website. Also, I would like um, um, to, to say to our host to have a nice and pleasant stay in our city uh, this day, and for all others, uh, have a nice rest of the day today. So, once more, thank you very much, all of you.